thanks for the kind of applause. My first brand when I started at P&G was Mr. Clean. It's called Meister Proper in Germany. He's right up there. In my first week on the job, they gave me a 150-page report with numbers on the habits and practices of housewives in Germany and said, analyze that. It took me a week to analyze that and come up with the conclusion that the key attribute of a household cleaner is to clean. <laughs> no kidding. Earth-shattering conclusion. But we all felt that maybe it was not enough. So we formed a little task force, a product researcher, a market researcher, and myself. We rented a car, had one of these big video cameras, it was many years ago, big video cameras, and went around all over Germany, going into houses of housewives, of ladies, talking to them about their cleaning habits, and filming them cleaning the house, and the kitchen, and the bathroom. So here I was I, MBA of a kind of famous, prestigious US university, asking consumers what is their biggest, which dirt gives them the biggest headache, and what's the emotional payoff of a clean kitchen. After about a month, I was checking in with some friend of mine who went to Goldman Sachs. And he said, oh, it's just involved in a you know, multi-billion dollar corporate bond sale, right? And he asked me, what are you doing? And I said, you know, I'm kind of on the road filming churning housewives. <laughs> and he looked at me like, is he kind, some kind of director? Like, some kind of director? I said, no, I work for Procter & Gamble. And my mother calls me after the first month on the job. Hey, I want to see how you're doing. I said, the same thing. I'm on the road filming German housewives. <laughs> and she goes live, you could have asked me. I'm a German housewife, <laughs> right? And by the way, what did I send you to university for? And at the end of the phone, I heard my grandmother shouting, I told you he should have become a doctor. <laughs> so the social prestige of what I was doing was kind of fairly low. But the learnings that I was getting was extremely high. Extremely fascinating learnings. I learned, yeah, performance is important for a house and cleaner. It has to clean. But doing, getting the next upgrade in a way that, uh, you know, it would now kill 99% of the bacteria versus just 98, is probably not going to cut it. And I also learned what consumers really, really disliked. They thought it was a chore. They thought cleaning is a chore. Right, it's difficult, and I have to do all this. And they were looking for ease of cleaning. They were looking for some fun, actually. And they were looking for a delightful experience. That was really like a fascinating thing. You know, after two weeks, the product researcher, the market researcher said, oh, we have enough. And I was so fascinated, I said, can I do this for another week on my own? So I did. I drove around, talked to housewives, did the video filming. So I got all these tremendous insights, and uh, you know, I was about much younger then, and there was also one or two delicate situations. And I know there's some HR people in the room. I just want to confirm I upheld the PVP <laughs> at any point in time, OK? <laughs> now for the young people in the room, and you're all young, or much, much, much younger, why well, you chose this picture. This is Freddie Mercury. It's from a band called Queen. Does anybody know knows this band? <laughs> hey, OK, you're not that young. Very good. There's a very famous song, it's called I Want to Break Free, where he kind of plays a, plays a housewife who wants to break free, right? And for the future, we used this song as an inspiration, the video from MTV at the time, to, to really motivate us to, to develop a great uh, proposition on that one. But what I, what I really, that told me at the beginning, you got to know your consumer. What I learned from this exercising, knowing your consumer, knowing your brand, knowing your product is not enough. You gotta love it. I really started appreciating these ladies. I really liked them as friends, right? So living with them, you know, it's always felt like living with them, <laughs> gave me so many insights. And I'm seriously, you know, that, that made the proposition so much stronger. So I thought, how can I phrase my topic today? You know this movie and this book, Eat, Pray, Love? Ladies, you know it, right? <laughs> it's Julia Roberts, it's the movies. I felt inspired by this. So I said, <laughs> all this, coming up with big ideas and delight is about know, love, live. Know your consumer, your brand, your category, love it with all your heart, be really be passionate about it, and live it. Because I'm hearing very often these days on the corridor, and I know if it's not only me, stuff like, oh, you know, we're selling, what we're selling is just a shampoo. 
or my favorite one, hey, we're just in consumer goods, we're not curing cancer. That's not a good attitude to have. We really have to take this serious and love and live our products. There's even an emotional payoff. You know, when I was working in household cleaning, my wife still tells me that today was the best days of my marriage. Because I was cleaning the house three times a week with the newest products. <laughs> and I'm not doing anything anymore, okay? So, and this work really led to a fantastic proposition to complete repositioning, where we repositioned the brand from pure performance to speed and ease of cleaning, um, put in a couple of scent variants to really have the experiential uh, um, experience for consumers. And what we also did is uh, we had a fun commercial where women were gliding over the farm. It was just fun and music, and people really liked it, and it built the brand by knowing, loving, and living the consumer. Now you know what that is. This is a favela. They call it in Latin America, or barrio. That's in Caracas, Venezuela. I spent a couple of years there as marketing director for hair care for, for Latin America. And me and my team, we went very often to, to, to the barrio because our key target group was tier three consumers, what we call tier three consumers then, which were basically poor people who lived in favelas, in, in, in barrios, and we visited them very often and even we spent some time with them, spending days with them in their rooms. I think, I'm sure there's a policy today that's no longer possible because it's a little bit dangerous. But this was, again, invaluable because you got to learn to know these people as families, right? You think about tier three consumer, right? What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. But if you know them, the people, talk about real people. You have to imagine the following situation. I've been, I've been spend a day with one of these families. It's a kind of a one bedroom apartment. That's it. It's just one room and, and a little bathroom and a little kitchen on the side. And it's evening and the husband is coming home. Husband is coming home. Going to the middle of the room, there's a reclining chair. He sits in, he switches on the flat screen TV. Flat screen TVs at that time wasn't something very new. And when you had a flat screen TV in the barrio, you were the king of the barrio, right? I mean, really, Sony had a, had a scheme where poor people under, under the uh, average income could buy a flat screen TV and pay it off over 20 years. Pay off your TV over 20 years. But it was a social symbol. So the guy, anyway, sits in, switches it on, gets something to drink, and the poor lady of the house has to run behind four kids. You know, keep them all happy, one coming out from school, da 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 da, has to make dinner, has to run around, and so on and so on. At one point in time, the husband says, shh, quiet, I'm watching TV, right? So I'm not sure if this is now Latin American macho, or if this is just a global insight called man. <laughs> Probably the later. In any case, so I, in, I go to the, to, the, to, the, to the housewife, you know, to the lady in my, in my broken Spanish and said, your husband seems to be pretty happy in front of his TV. It seems to make him happy. What is it that makes you happy? What, what, what is it that you miss? He said, I'll show you. So she goes to this tiny little bathroom where you can hardly move, and she brings me this, something like this, a sachet of Pantan, opened, held together by, by a safety pin. And at that point in time, you have to imagine sachets that were much smaller. There was a shampoo made for one-time usage, and it cost less than a dollar, OK? And she pinned it together and said, I'm using this every second day for a week. So the one-time usage, she was spreading out over many days because she considered this her little luxury. I said, would I ever say again I'm just selling just the shampoo? And I had said this before. I'm really, really, really guilty as charged. So she saw this as a luxury, right? And, and I thought, you know, we have the duty to make something great out of that if our consumer sees our product like this. We may not appreciate it. Eh, it's just Pantan. She does. And this changed everything for us. We were at that point in time in a, in a red race to, to get the price down. This is the Chanel number no. five of hair care. Chanel number no. five of hair care. Once we made this kind of statement, we said, okay, we've got to invest in quality. We killed all price promotion, killed all TBR, took the money, and increased the advertising budget by 50% increasing the advertising budget. This group, have you ever heard about that? <laughs> Probably not. Anyway, so we did that, and we took advertising production from cheap Argentina to Asia, Asia, Malaysia, and post-production to LA, not Latin America, Los Angeles, <laughs> to get this super, super shiny hair and this great, great, great appeal to make it look like a million dollars, to make it look like the Chanel number no. five of hair care. A complete shift, and actually, Doing that has really elevated the brand that's brought us back on the growth track. 
just by living with consumers, loving them and understanding what they want and delighting them because they want to look up to Pantene. That's an aspirational brand. It's not like you're my best friend. I want to look up to you. You're my luxury item. That really was a huge, huge, huge breakthrough. Now, this is my first picture on the beach in Venezuela, two weeks after I arrived. <laughs> Notice the short hair. Notice the patches of black still in there, right? And when I didn't watch my kids running around playing in the sand, this is what I saw. <laughs> Don't get second thought. This is what I saw, the hair. I want to focus your attention on the hair. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> and I realized all of my consumers have long hair. I didn't see anybody with short hair. I'm sitting here with my short hair, looking at my consumers with long hair, and they're all putting something into their hair. They're all going to their backs, putting something into their hair, like this and doing this all the time once they're out of the water. And I wonder what I did. I didn't dare to ask, because if I have the European guy with my sunglasses go there and say, hola, chica, huh? what do you have in your back? <laughs> I probably get slapped, or their boyfriend comes and throws them into the water. So I said to my team, there's something going on. We've got to go more to the beach. Guys, we've got to spend more time on the beach. <laughs> By the way, this is pretty travel efficient. The beach is not very far in Venezuela, so you don't have to spend much on travel. Don't get your hopes up. We're not flying to Japan here, right? And so we spent more time at the beach, and we realized, and people were asking, what are you using? They were using a product, leave-in conditioner. It's a conditioner you don't wash out. It's a conditioner you live in. Why? Because on the beach, it's hot. There's salt, salt water, and there's wind, and your hair looks all terrible, and so on, and so on, and so on. Because you know what? We didn't even have this product. We were a market leader in conditioners and shampoos, but we didn't even know the segment existed. When we got the data, we realized it's already 25% of the market, and we're not even there. So obviously, we got to get there. So look at this picture. By the way, the person next to my wife is not her sister, it's me, nine months later. Because I said, it cannot be that I have to short hair, my consumers have all this long hair, right? So I let my hair grow down to my shoulders. It, at the end, it reached to here, right? So I can really experience the product and live what the consumer lives. Thanks God I did that, because we need a leave-in conditioner too. Obviously, the global guy said, oh, it's not in the global menu, oh, it's no priority, blah, 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 blah. So I did this big presentation to management with basically a few numbers, pictures from ladies on the beach, and me putting this stuff on my hair, <laughs> competitive product dripping down to the floor. So Jorge Uribe and some of the old LA team still remember that presentation. Gave me a whole lot of equity there. And we got the project approved, right? And man, look what difference it makes on the beach. This is with leave-on conditioners. <laughs> you see that? That's salt water, wind. That's when you have a Pantene leave-on conditioner. <laughs> There's a video, so we can do some advertising messages, right? karuki san can we do that? Yeah, we probably can. Pantene Pro-V. Healthy hair, it shines on the beach in under one minute. OK, we got that. <laughs> So, got to live, love your consumer. Let's fast forward today. I'm working on SK2, OK? Woo! Thank you. SK2 is a tier one brand, right? But shouldn't we rather say it's a brand for women that are obsessed and fanatical with the quality of your hair? If you phrase it like this, you're much, much closer to what the consumer really wants and what delights the consumer. And the most important part in SK2 is we have a brand story. The brand story is, you know, it was discovered in a, there's a miracle ingredient, Pitera, chance discovery in a Japanese uh, uh, brewery, because they found out that uh, all the people there were old, they had old faces, but they touched the fermented rice every day. So there must be a secret ingredient in the fermented rice that keeps their hands young, because their hands were much, much younger. So basically, the story is, old face, young hands, right? That's the, basically the, the brand story. You know, my team... <laughs> And my organization does much, much more to lift the brand story. It's important to lift the brand story. I can do a little of it. So what my part of living the brand story is here. Because my hair is old, but my skin is still young. <laughs> so my incarnation of the brand story is old hair, young skin. Now the rest of the team does much, much, much more. Our, this is a beauty consultant that I met in China the other day. She has, she's from Taiwan. She has worked on the brand for 30 years. And she gave her retirement speech. And this was very, very moving. She talked about how she loved her consumers, how she lived with her customers so much that she introduced little service elements on her own so that she had about 100 consumers that stayed with her for more than 20 years. Because she loved and she lived the brand. And she sent me that picture. That's her with her family. 
okay? That's her husband and her son and her daughter-in-law and her granddaughter. And the daughter-in-law has also become an SK2 beauty consultant because she was so much inspired by her mother-in-law. And so I immediately look, the little girl, she could become an SK2 beauty consultant too, right? <laughs> now, we have a topic in SK2, like a motto, it's called change destiny, right? We believe you can change the destiny of your skin. You don't have to live with what you're born with. And we also believe you can change the destiny of your life. This is, one, again, one of the statements you can be pretty cynical about and say, ah, it's a skincare product. How can it change destiny? But trust me, believing in this and making it your mission and living the brand is really giving us an amazing amount of traction. One example, employees, how they lift the brand and how they turn into advocates. This is a limited edition we're going to launch in October, which is based on the idea of butterflies, you know, the idea of a transformation to a beautiful uh, uh, being. And one of our brand managers who wanted to re remain anonymous, but what can I do? It was on Facebook, so I can use it, right? Who ran this project, was so inspired by the project, lifted so much, she created his own, her own dress with butterfly, and she gave a fantastic aerial dance performance on Saturday night. Check it out on Facebook. Living the brand, and living the brand and doing all that stuff, right, has already led to the next edition, more delightful for next year, because new ideas are coming out this every day. New ideas are coming from employees because they live the brand. Change destiny. This is a, a video, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to show you the video. We hold that. It has been clicked on 15 million times already, um, and uh, you can see it on, on, on YouTube. And it's all about change destiny. And we have already, there's a script, uh, Tang Wei, our model, says a lot of things about life and destiny. And we have already 400 consumers written us versions of their own script. So they have written their own destiny. And looking at them, I'm pretty much convinced that these scripts will hold the next idea for the next campaign, for the next delightful idea. And it's pretty good. You know, delightful ideas coming from consumers are already delighted. Can it get any better? And the best of all, and I think this is for me the, the, the pinnacle of, uh, of, uh, of what the brand can do if you live it, if you love it, if you, if you really love the product. We have a study going in in Japan since 10 years with about more than 100, uh, um, 100 women who um, basically uh, using our product, not using our product. It studies the effects of aging with and without SK2. I probably don't have to tell you, you know, Who's using SK2 is not using SK2, right? That's pretty obvious, right? But the, the best thing is, normally we would consider this woman as what in PNG? Research subject, right? We would say N equals 100. Now, with our R&D department, not only considering this woman as research department, but considering them as friends and staying in touch with them, what has really happened is they're now speaking up for us. We have more and more of the women from this study who love the product now so much showing up at our press conferences, showing up in our YouTube videos and saying, we want to speak for you. They're not getting any money for this. But imagine turning research subject into adequates if you love, live, and know the brand. That's uh, pretty amazing. The final thing that I want to show you is one of the ladies. She said, I can even sing for you. She's a singer, and she has fun singing, and, and, and she, she likes the brand. So she made a little video for us and said, you can use it anywhere that you want. Can we briefly run this? I have one minute, right? Yeah. yeah. That's why they put me on last. <laughs> その人たちのために歌ってあげるという気持ちがいろんなことを歌で表現できると思うので試験に参加したことで S 血を知りましたいつも見てる職場のスタッフや先生たちが一番先に気づいてくれて何使ってるのっていうのをよく聞かれたりして。メインなのでもう私を見てくださいっていう気持ちが<笑>すごく強いです<笑>秋田っていうのは本当にあの日本では非常に美人が多いということで知られていますそれサムディズオラップ It's not enough to just know your product and your brand your consumer you gotta love it you really 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 gotta love it and you gotta live it 
And you've got to get much, much closer to your consumer. If you think you're close today, get closer. Because what's going to happen with that delightful big ideas will just flow out of that. That's a guarantee. Thank you. <laughs>